Hello, everyone. This is our project, Ukraine Now, uh, Vision for the Future. And this is a uh, very new for us format uh, because we, for the first time we are conducting this interview in English because we have very important, very special guest today. And before Victoria introduces our guest, I will remind a few words about our project, who we are. We are the National Agency uh, for the Corruption Prevention. From the very beginning of the war, we hardly work uh, with sanctions, with personal sanctions, and our today's guest uh, knows a lot about this, our activity. And uh, from the very beginning of the war, we started recording these interviews uh, to understand the changes that are happening with our society, with, with us, to fix these very important moments uh, uh, which are happening because of their, this very terrible, horrible, awful war started by Russia. And uh, with that, we want to understand which lessons we should learn uh, as a society and uh, what principles we should keep in mind uh, telling about renovation, rebuilding of Ukraine. And we uh, make this project with the support of uh, our partners, UACI, this is anti-corruption initiative, the project uh, funded by uh, European delegation and uh, the embassy of Denmark and uh, two more partners with us here, the business schools of two greatest Ukrainian universities, uh, UKU Business School, Ukrainian Catholic University Business School and Kiev Mohila Business School, by the way, my alma mater. And with that, I finally stop and pass the floor to Vita, who will introduce our guest today. Yeah. Hi there. Today we have a really remarkable guest. He's a leading expert on Russia, American for aging policy and democratic development around the world, former U.S. ambassador to Russia, professor of political science at Stanford University and author of a well-known book in Ukraine, From Cold War to Hot Peace, The Inside Story of Russia and America. Michael McFall. Mr. Michael, you're very welcome. Nice to have you here with us. Thanks for having me. Let's start. Uh, from the first day, the NSP has been actively working on expanding the sanctions list. Uh, we have seen mayor attention to the gas and oil embargo, financial sanctions, etc. But the individual sanctions matter has been somehow lagging behind or receiving less attention from the so-called sanctioned coalitions. And uh, do you think that individual sanctions can be effective in autocratic societies like Russia? And uh, is there more to be done? Well, first, thanks for having me. Uh, and thanks for the work that you guys have been doing on sanctions, uh, because I do believe that individual sanctions matter. Um, it's hard to measure the effect of sanctions, I would say, generally. I, I know this academic literature well. I teach it here at Stanford. And cause and effect is difficult to trace. Uh, it usually takes years to see the effect of sanctions on changing foreign policy behavior. Um, and, you know, the, the literature is mixed. And there are some cases where it's worked. South Africa is a great case. And there's some cases where it hasn't worked. Um, but I, I think there's another piece to uh, sanctions that sometimes gets left out in the discussion amongst foreign policy circles that I, that I travel in. And that is sometimes you have to do the morally correct thing, um, irrespective of whether you think it will achieve the effect or not. And there's no doubt in my mind that that is uh, one of the factors uh, at play in, in this case uh, of, of implementing sanctions. Uh, as Sasha said, this was uh, Putin's war. This is a brutal, barbaric, unprovoked war. Uh, it has no justification whatsoever. It violates many norms and rules and laws of the international system. Uh, and so there has to be a moral response to it uh, along many dimensions, in, and I think including first and foremost individual sanctions. Um, now, some disagree with that and say, well, these people are not directly involved. They didn't make these decisions. Why are they being punished for a, a decision that Putin made? 
And, and, and I understand that argument. Uh, and I personally, so you know, know many people on the sanctions list. Um, by the way, I'm on Russia's sanctions list. Uh, so I know what it's like to be on a sanctions list. I have been since 2014. Um, but, but I think when there's something so horrific that your government does, uh, and it's a government that you support through paying taxes, it's a government that has created the permissive conditions for you to make money inside Russia, uh, that, that, that it means that you also have an individual moral obligation uh, when that government behaves the way it does. And so I, I believe uh, strongly that they're, they're morally just and necessary uh, on the moral issues. Uh, then there's the, the question of effectiveness or not. And I would just say one thing about that. Uh, the fact that those that are on the list uh, are trying so hard to get off the list of sanctions suggests that they're working, suggests that they're effective. If they were so ineffective, as some critics claim, why would they be putting so much energy into trying to lift the sanctions? And I mean that both about sectoral sanctions, but especially about individual sanctions. Uh, yeah, actually, we discussed it uh, for the several times that uh, our assumption uh, here in the NCP is that uh, you could have or military collapse or administrative collapse. And uh, from our point of view, administrative collapse in Russia for the whole world is much better than military collapse, especially for Ukraine, because we all understand that all this military collapse will happen on our territory. And of course, we are not lucky about that. Uh, moving from sanctions to, to, to more general questions. Uh, Mike, from your point of view, uh, we many international partners uh, give us some information uh, about the potential invasion. But personally, I myself, I, I wasn't ready for the war. And uh, I think not only, not only myself. Maybe as a country, we should be better prepared. Uh, maybe we should did some, some, some special preparation in, in, in any way. What lessons uh, can we as a country learn from your point of view from this war? Because lessons learned is the focus of these interviews for us. We think that we shouldn't ignore mistakes that we made and we should uh, speak about them, analyze them uh, before any discussions about future principles, visions and, and whatsoever. So we should uh, make this uh, work on, 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 the, on the possible mistakes that we did. From your point of view, what uh, could we do better? before the war? Well, that's a really hard, important question. Uh, I think it's an important question, not only for Ukrainians, but also for Americans and European leaders. What more could we have done together uh, before this war to try to have prevented it? And, and I would say two or three lessons. Uh, one, I think we collectively uh, underestimated Putin's uh, proclivity for using force to achieve his ideological objectives. Um, I think we, we, we hoped falsely that he was a rational actor, that he would calculate cost benefit analysis and then decide, well, this will be too costly. I better not do this. Um, we thought that he could be deterred through words uh, as opposed to uh, military preparedness. And that uh, at the end of the day, uh, the, the cost would be too high and he wouldn't do this. And I think we grossly underestimated how ideas and his ideology motivate him. You know, here in the United States, there's a, people that study international relations. They, they treat states as unitary actors and rational actors that behave according to certain scientific principles. Um, and, and I think we've always been misled by those theories when talking about Putin. Uh, we always have, have, have underestimated how leaders 
uh, throughout history, not just Putin, but most certainly Putin, uh, can sometimes be very motivated by ideas and ideologies and very dangerous ones. Uh, in the case of Mr. Putin, uh, Mr. Putin is an imperialist. Uh, if you lead and, and look at what he says, uh, he doesn't believe that your nation is a separate independent nation. He doesn't believe that you guys are any different than Russians. You're just, you're just Russians with accents uh, in his views. And, and so had we understood that from the very beginning together, I mean, all of us, uh, then if you remember in the run up to the war, there was lots of talk about NATO expansion and, oh, this is a war to stop NATO. Um, and, and I know my government, the Biden administration put a lot of energy into trying to, to tell Mr. Putin that we're not going to expand NATO because we don't want to threaten Russia uh, by having Ukraine into NATO. Well, I think in retrospect, we, we now understand that that was a complete misreading of what was motivating uh, Mr. Putin. He wasn't worried about NATO expansion. Uh, he knew that Ukraine was not joining NATO anytime soon. By the way, he also knows that NATO's never invaded the Soviet Union or Russia and never will. Uh, he was motivated by other things. And so I think that was a miscalculation collectively that we had about what motivates him personally. Uh, that's the first thing. Um, the second thing is, I think collectively, uh, your government uh, and, and the Biden administration and other members of NATO um, uh, did not do enough to prepare militarily to try to deter this war. Um, and I think it goes way back. I don't think it just is, you know, earlier in this year. I think I think after Russia invaded Georgia in 2008, uh, we should have had a program uh, to um, uh, arm the Georgians, to arm Ukraine, to be prepared for a military attack from Russia. Uh, I think going all the way back to 2008, uh, we should have been more worried than we were about that. And if you think about all the, the weapons that have come to your country, from my country and from many other countries around the world, what if all those weapons were in place before February 24th? Uh, what if all those weapon systems had been in installed before? Uh, maybe we, we could have deterred Putin from invading your country. Um, uh, and so therefore, I think the lesson learned for the future is, um, Nobody, you cannot rely on diplomats or NATO or, or anybody from the outside to defend your country. At the end of the day, uh, Ukraine has to defend its own territory. Uh, and so I think now that we've tragically broken through the, the hesitation by the West of providing uh, military assistance, serious military assistance to your country because of this tragic war, I think when the war ends, uh, the imperative has to be to arm Ukraine to the teeth. To, to uh, you know, I think the parallels are countries like Taiwan or Israel that uh, uh, live in tough neighborhoods, have uh, frightening uh, neighbors next to them, and therefore uh, invest extraordinary amounts of money and attention uh, to defense because they, they know that they have to stand by themselves to defend themselves. And that will cost a lot of money. Uh, that will require a restructuring uh, uh, of attitudes towards the military in Ukraine. But tragically, I don't see any other choice. And I think it would be really important to do this right away after the end of the war uh, so that Western countries who are providing this assistance will do so right away. I worry that everybody, once there's peace, will say, oh, well, we don't need any more HIMARS. We don't need any more Javelins. We don't need any more uh, uh, aircraft. Uh, and I disagree with that. I, I think as long as Putin is in power in Russia, uh, he will present a threat to your country. And therefore you have to, the, the very next day after the war is over, you have to be, begin preparing 
to deter a future war. Yeah, thank you. You said that uh, Putin is imperialist. So from your point of view, what are the post-Soviet, post-colonial diseases we should recover from? Like paternalism, weak defense, lack of subjectivity and clear geopolitical directions, et cetera. Well, I, I firmly believe that um, uh, individuals matter in the making of history. Uh, I know that, that that's a contentious issue in, in my country, and I know it's contentious among scholars in your country. Uh, yes, culture matters. Yes, history matters. Most certainly power matters, right? Uh, if Russia had the military capabilities of, of Kyrgyzstan or Moldova, uh, you wouldn't be threatened by them, right? To just to make state obvious uh, different kinds of cases. So the fact that Russia has capacity, military capacity, that they recovered from the collapse of the Soviet Union, uh, that matters. And we were not paying enough attention to that, at least in my country, modernization program that Putin had invested in. But I also think that individuals matter. Uh, and, and I think it's a tragedy, the greatest tragedy of the 21st century, that when Boris Yeltsin was thinking of stepping down, uh, that he uh, at one point thought about uh, picking another person to, to, to replace him. Uh, Boris Nemtsov was his name before he was assassinated in 2015, uh, but he, that he chose Putin. Um, and over the decades, Putin has become more and more imperialist in his views. I, I don't think he was always this way. I, he, had, he had core elements that were this way, but he's become more arrogant, uh, uh, more believing in might makes right. Um, and remember, he's been in power for 20 years, so he believes that he knows everything. And, and my personal view is that he grossly miscalculated uh, he thought it was going to be an easy war in Ukraine. He thought the West was going to do nothing, and he overreached. Not unlike, by the way, that Brezhnev overreached when he invaded Afghanistan after a lot of successes in helping Marxist-Leninist regimes come to power uh, in the 1970s. So I think uh, in retrospect, in terms of lessons learned, uh, it turned out that, that, that Soviet imperial attitudes did not collapse with the Soviet Union uh, when the Soviet Union collapsed. And even more dangerously, I would say, Russian imperial attitudes did not collapse. Um, and Putin personifies them and shows that old ideas that we thought were, were extinct can be resurrected by certain leaders. Um, and that, I think, means for us all to understand better uh, the culture and history uh, of Russia and Ukraine. Um, I think in my country, uh, there's a lot of people that, that share some of, of Putin's statements about Ukraine. Uh, Russians, Ukrainians, they're all the same, aren't they? The, their languages are basically the same. Didn't Russia start in, in Kiev, Rus? Uh, uh, there's lots of people that think that. Um, uh, even, uh, you know, scholars and professors in my country uh, think along those terms. And so I think another lesson learned from this tragic war is that we collectively, um, uh, with the help, first and foremost, of Ukrainian uh, scholars, by the way, uh, have to have a program uh, to re-educate uh, the world about Ukrainian history and Russian history so that these myths will finally be dispelled and people will know the true history of Ukraine. Uh, Mike, but you understand that... Uh... Russia actively uses propaganda and used propaganda for all this time uh, to promote all these messages and narratives uh, for the whole world. Uh, I've just read the very interesting book uh, by the, uh, sorry, forgot the name of the author, never, ne never mind. Uh, but uh, Astankina and everything that Russia's telev television uh, did is not moral. 
and everybody inside understands that this is not moral and Ukraine won't do the same. So if Russia promote Russian's narrative for, for, for this whole time uh, to the West through Russia today, we can't, uh, we can't answer the same way, even if we could. So what, what can we do? Because this is not moral. Uh, what can we do instead of that uh, to promote Ukrainians' interests, uh, except of just uh, educating everybody uh, and uh, prepare scholars? And by the way, I'm very happy to say that I'm the part of one of these programs because I've uh, uh, learned a lot in Stanford with Ukrainian uh, Emerging Leaders Program. What could we do? as an alternative to moral alternative to Russia today to promote Ukraine? Yeah, that's a really hard question. And when I served in the government, we were always frustrated by that because they had one set of rules and we had another set of rules and we were constrained by the truth. Uh, one of my colleagues used to always say that it's so frustrating. We have to be constrained by the truth. Uh, Mr. Lavrov, uh, Zaharova, uh, you know, a Russia Today, the Simonyan, they're not constrained by the truth, right? And so it creates an asymmetry. It's an unfair competition. But I do think I agree with the, the, the spirit of your question that we should not uh, go down the path where we become more like them. I think that would be uh, immoral and in the long term would be adversely affect our interests and undermine our values. And I, when I say our, I mean the democratic world, right? Because this is a challenge for Ukraine as much as it is for the United States. But I do think uh, instead of that, I do think we have to be much more aggressive, much more strategic about information. So in, in my country, I don't know how it is in Ukraine, but we spend a, a lot of time talking about fighting disinformation. Um, and I'm, I'm not against that, I'm all for that. We should fight disinformation. Uh, and we've made some progress in my country. Uh, you know, um, we, if you go on Facebook or YouTube or Google these days uh, or Twitter, uh, all of Russia Today uh, messages are now labeled, this is a state sponsored that that didn't happen two years ago and and by the way stanford uh the institute i run here at stanford has been very involved in that in working with our, these companies to do that to in a voluntary basis to not allow them to amplify so easily uh buying ads is now impossible for them on those platforms that's all good in terms of fighting disinformation um but i i think we need a more active campaign in promoting information and again, I just speaking mostly about my own country, but we're not doing enough in my view. Uh, we're not spending enough money. Uh, the Chinese and the Russians outspend our uh, platforms for this. Um, I'm thinking about Radio Liberty, for instance, and Voice of America. They're, they're tiny, tiny little programs uh, uh, compared to Russia today. And so I think we need to have, a, you know, this is a lesson from the Cold War where we got better at this. We spent more money to, to promote information. Um, and today it's even more challenging. It means investing in subsidizing um, um, uh, all kinds of, of, of media because media is very challenged today because of economics around the world, uh, in your country, in my country. Um, and part of that battle has to be inside Russia. Uh, I think it's a... It's a giant mistake. Some people say, well, all Russians, they just support Putin. They're all evil. Uh, why should we care about what they think? We just should try to contain them and destroy them. And I understand that sentiment. And most certainly I understand that sentiment when I talk to Ukrainians, uh, given what horrific barbaric things Russians are doing inside your country. It's not just Vladimir Putin that are doing these things. These are Russians. Uh, uh, they are doing these things. It's a it's a system, as you said before. It's not just one person, um, and it's a, a system that we would like to see disrupted and ultimately destroyed. That is the the, the Putin's regime. 
But one way to do that is in the information world to try to bring real information, first and foremost, about the war uh, to Russian people. Um, and, and some you'll never, you'll never reach, right? People that live in the bubble uh, of Putin's propaganda machine, uh, they'll, they'll never change their minds. That reminds me of, of people in, in America who, who, who are in information bubbles, either for the left or the right, and, and they won't change their, their minds. But there are, you know, from data that I've seen, uh, there's actually large uh, millions of Russians that are much more passive about the war, that are not, they're not pro-war, they're not anti-Putin, they're just passive. Um, and I think we uh, in the free world need to have a better strategy for trying to reach those people. And not just through uh, television and radio and social media, but through exchange programs, like you were talking about, Sasha, uh, to bring those people to, to Ukraine. Uh, to Poland, to Germany, to the United States, uh, uh, to help change their minds, uh, to get them out of the bubble uh, that they're living in inside Russia. And then finally, on this front, um, as you well know, there have been thousands, tens of thousands of Russians that have fled uh, uh, as a result of the war. Um, and those people someday, I believe will be uh, a part of a new Russia. Um, and that's a Russia that will be much more friendly to Ukraine. And, and so we have to figure out a way to help those people, to educate those people, so that when the day comes uh, after Putin's regime collapses, there'll be new people with new ideas to replace them. Because the worst of all worlds would be if Putin, uh, you know, dies or becomes incapacitated, and he's just replaced by more people that just think just like him. Uh, that's not in in Ukraine's strategic interest, and it's most certainly not in strategic interest for my country. Uh, thank you, Mike. Uh, I want to ask you about the international support of Ukraine. Uh, we right now receive the huge support of your country and other partners, and we, we are really grateful for that. Uh, who doesn't know Michael McFall is heading the group of sanctions with international, many, many international experts. Uh, Mike is leading this group himself, and we are really grateful for that. This is the very important, and I think it's not easy job uh, to do that and uh, mitigate many, many interests inside this group. Uh, what volunteers, Ukrainian volunteers can do more? What government could do better? What international partners uh, can do more? Maybe you can see some more options uh, for us to, to, to move faster. Well, in the, in the biggest picture, of which probably volunteers can't influence. Um, but, uh, you know, I always say when I have the chance to talk to my friends in the Biden administration, and I have many friends in the Biden administration, uh, we all work together in the Obama administration. So, um, uh, including the president, uh, you know, he was the vice president when I worked at the White House. Um, and I traveled to Ukraine with him, by the way, one time in 2009 with Vice President Biden. Um, and what I say to them is uh, I applaud what they've done to one, strengthen NATO, which I think is important for everyone, uh, two, arm Ukraine, and three, sanction Russia. Uh, those three core components of their strategy, I think they're doing well. I criticize them on the public strategic communications part, the public diplomacy, that piece of their strategy, I think is underdeveloped compared to those other three. Uh, but, but on those three, I say, congratulations. Uh, that's great that you did X, Y, and Z, that you did new sanctions, that you provided new weapons, that you had a successful NATO summit, that we have two new uh, candidates to join the, the alliance. That, congratulations, that is all 
great work. And now what are you going to do tomorrow uh, to expand the work? Um, you know, I'm a professor, as you know, and, and, you know, we have these things called midterm grades, right? So yeah, I give them A's for their midterm grades, but there's no final grades until the war is over. Um, and, and on especially military assistance and sanctions, I think there's way more that should be done. Uh, we should be providing more weapons, better weapons and provide them faster. It's just that simple. Uh, and it's the same with sanctions. We've done a lot, yes, congratulations, but there's way more that, that, that you can do. Uh, and on individual sanctions, you guys have, have, have paved a roadmap for them. Uh, when you think there's, there's not more that can be done, uh, you have named literally the names uh, that, that they could do if they wanted to uh, do more. So I think on those two fronts, there's a lot more that should be done. And, and I would say for individuals to keep putting pressure on the West to keep doing more on sanctions uh, and on military assistance. And of course, on economic assistance too, I left that out, but of course that's important for your country. Uh, uh, without that, you know, there would be even more uh, uh, problems inside Ukraine. And the West I think is, is doing a lot. Um, uh, I worry that over time, uh, there will be exhaustion with that support, especially the economic assistance piece, by the way, uh, because our economies are all suffering inflation. There's predictions of recession. Um, there's um, political forces throughout European democracies, and most certainly here in the United States, that blame sanctions for inflation. They just say it straight up. These sanctions are causing inflation, uh, especially about gasoline prices here in the United States. We have political uh, groups that say that. Um, and so I think it's important for Ukrainians and, and people like me to keep explaining why that's not the case, uh, why Putin is responsible for uh, the uptick in, in prices. And you know, the argument I always make is, yes, we cannot sustain billions of dollars of economic assistance forever to Ukraine. Even a rich country like the United States, we can't do that. We have problems here at home. And so the best way to stop that is to provide more military assistance now, more sanctions now, as a way to speed the end of the war. Uh, to me, that, that's the logic. And so I think anybody that can provide that kind of explanation, I think it's important for our publics in the West, in Europe and the United States to hear that kind of logic. Let's speak a little about recovery. It's still economic issue. It's very important for Ukraine. Like recently, Ukraine recovery conference ended in Lugano, Switzerland, and Ukraine presented its recovery strategy, actually. What can you say about our recovery plans and how realistic and feasible are they, both from the point of view of ambitions and resources needed and money, of course? Well, uh, I've uh, participated in some conversations with your government about the recovery plan. Uh, I was not in Lugano, though I was invited to go. I, I couldn't go. Um, I, I would say a few broad things. Um, one, I think it's right and proper that um, government officials, both first and foremost in Ukraine, but around the world, start planning for recovery now uh, and not wait until the end of the war. So I applaud that effort. Uh, I think getting into the details is uh, proper as was presented in Lugano. Um, and I think it's important to remind the world how big uh, project this is going to be $750 billion. That's a really big number. Um, this project is, is large and will require uh, multi-donors to be involved, everybody to be involved. Um, and so I think that's right to set the table that way. I think for me, um, if I were uh, tweaking the plan, uh, I would try to do two things. Uh, one, greater prioritization. Uh, right now, it feels like everything under the sun needs to change. 
Uh, and, and I think you got to do, you have to have a sequence of things you want to do first, to things you want to do second, things you want to do third. Otherwise, uh, where to begin? And then second, I would, I would just give more emphasis to um, political issues, transparency issues, corruption issues, as you all are working on. Um, uh, this is not just an economic issue. Uh, this is a political issue. And the political economy of reconstruction, I think, needs to be front and center uh, and not just, you know, one talking point among 15. Uh, this is a chance to restructure uh, not just what has been destroyed by the Russians, but what existed before. Um, and, and I think, you know, um, using this moment to do everything better. Uh, it, 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 you only get these moments every now and again where you have the kind of unity that you have inside Ukraine. Uh, and so I think that's very important to use this moment. Um, so oligarchic capitalism has to end. Uh, that era is over, needs to be over in Ukraine. Um, greater transparency about what the government does and how it uses these res uh, resources has to begin. And I applaud the efforts uh, that have happened already. I'm, I'm not one of those people in the West that says, oh, Ukraine's corrupt and they'll never be, uh, get better. No, uh, there have been tremendous reforms in Ukraine over the last few years, and you've been part of them, by the way. Uh, so you know that there's the possibility for change. Um, my, I just think making that a higher priority and a greater focus uh, uh, would be good, not only because I think it's good for Ukraine, but I think it will help to attract more money, both from governments and from the private sector that you're going to need to uh, invest in Ukraine uh, in the coming months and years. So I, I think everybody has an interest in doing it. Uh, it's just hard to do and it requires focus, but I think this is the moment to do that. As a national agency of the corruption prevention, we can't agree more that the problem is of corruption is very important for us, and uh, we as an agency should focus on that. Uh, from your perspective, Mike, uh, what should be the first priority? Fighting against corruption, maybe the civil service reform. We discussed it much when I was in Stanford because this is my very great area of interest. Uh, maybe we should liberalize the economy and invite more business uh, to this process. Maybe we should focus on uh, uh, court reform. I mean, um, judicial reform, reform of our courts and the enforcement system. From your perspective, I understand that everything should be done simultaneously, but anyway, uh, where would you start? Well, that's a hard question, and I don't want to pretend that I have an easy answer. But I do think um, liberalization combined with, and I don't even, I don't even, sometimes I don't even use the word corruption. I, I, I call it good governance or more democracy, uh, because sometimes people get too animated about the word corruption, uh, but greater transparency. In other words, the institutions, the political institutions that would support economic, liberal economic reforms, uh, and to see those things as synergistically intertwined. Uh, that's where I would start. And, and, and the, the reason is that you only get you know, new starts one time, right? You only get first new impressions one time. And right now, uh, Ukraine, uh, around the world has an incredibly positive brand name right now. Incredibly positive. There are flags, including at my house, there are Ukrainian flags all over my neighborhood here in California, right? You go to the stores, there are uh, new fashions in blue and yellow. Um, uh, you see all kinds of solidarity towards Ukraine right now, all over the world, just on TV and one of the major networks here, the one I work for, NBC News, 
There was a whole show developed uh, devoted to Ukraine uh, to provide support for Ukraine just on Sunday, uh, the day before Independence Day. Uh, so this is a moment, and your president, President Zelensky, has incredible uh, uh, support and goodwill towards him around the world. Um, and so to me, you need to use that moment uh, very strategically because it'll, it'll fade over time uh, because we'll get distracted with our own problems and our own elections. And that's where I think you say, this is the new Ukraine. Forget about the old Ukraine. This is the new Ukraine. And therefore you highlight the deeper democracy and the deeper commitment to, to, to liberal economic reforms uh, from the beginning uh, so that you attract that new capital because the kind of reconstruction that, that your government's talking about will require mostly private sector investment. Uh, and so anything you can do to encourage that, both domestic and foreign, foreign I think uh, uh, the imperative is now. I want to clarify, when we were in Stanford with uh, Slava Vakarchuk, we had many discussions and arguing about what is first, uh, the government reform, civil service reform, or judicial reform. Because judicial reform is justice, uh, the government reform is institutions. Uh, if you, you, you can't build institution without justice, but if you just if you don't have institutions, for what for you will be, you, you you you'll work for for, for justice. <laughs> From your perspective, what is more important for Ukraine now? Yeah, these are such complex questions, and and I would say the historical research we have about other countries does not give a clear cut answer to those questions. So um, I, I think we need to be humble in saying what we know, what is right, and what is wrong. Um, from my perspective, um, institutional state reform is the priority, uh, in part because you have more agency over doing that. Uh, judicial reform is a lot harder. It takes a lot more, uh, more time. It requires, you know, retraining of, of, of judges that, that, that can take decades in terms of cultural changes. I mean, of course, you, you, one needs to do both, but, but I would start with the reform of the state because you need a state that is friendly to private property. You need a, a state that supports competition. You need a state that won't be corrupt. And, and in the West, when people talk about, you know, that number 750 billion that came out of Lugano, uh, there are many, many people in the West that are worried that that will, that's too much money and it'll just be corrupt. It'll be just lead to corruption. There'll be too much money into the system. Uh, and I know that multilateral institutions and, and governments are very worried about that. So I think it's very important that the Ukrainian government signal that they are credibly committed to state reform as a way to interact with those international donors. Two questions uh, in one time. What should be the principles of Ukrainian recovery? The first one. And the second, what should Ukraine do to not miss our chance? You guys are asking very hard questions. Um, uh, I wish I had better answers. Um, you know, I do, I do believe that uh, there are these moments in history, the kind of big bang moments, where you, 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 you have a shot to break through and to part with your past and to break through to a new future. Um, I think of Germany after World War II. Um, I think of, you know, 1991 and the collapse of the Soviet Union. Uh, where some countries achieved that breakthrough and some did not. Um, you know, you think of Estonia today. Uh, they, they use that moment to do all the things we're talking about. And Estonia today uh, is a completely different place than it was 30 years ago. Uh, Poland today, a completely different place uh, because they, they managed to use that moment 
collectively. Um, and, you know, one of the lessons we know, I'm just Poland's on my mind because, you know, Ukraine and Poland started their processes of reform at basically the same GDP per capita. And, and we know today Poland is a lot richer and a lot better off than Ukraine is, right? Um, and, and we can talk about the sequencing of reforms and they did a lot of things right. They waited on privatization so that they got the right pricing, um, uh, et cetera. But one of the things that, that, that Poland had that say other countries, including Ukraine did not have uh, in the post-communist world was they, they had a lot of unity in their society uh, that said, this is our moment. This is our chance to, to escape the Soviet empire. And we might have to sacrifice uh, through this period. Remember the nineties was a period of economic uh, recession in Poland. It, it, it didn't happen overnight. It took many, many years before they got to recovery, but, but they could go through that period of recession because they were united and understanding that if we do this hard stuff together now, it'll be better for us all collectively later. Uh, and I think the lesson, and it's worth studying by the way, that, that they did that um, and they put aside some of their differences in the name of national unity because they didn't want to be part of the Soviet empire again. Uh, and it was a patriotic duty uh, to suffer. Uh, and to change and to abandon your old practices. And I think that is a, a moment for Ukraine. Uh, and I'm talking about uh, billionaires as well as school teachers. Uh, when I say that, I'm especially talking about billionaires, by the way, uh, where they just have to change their ways. Uh, if you just go back to the same structure of the Ukrainian economy from before, uh, that will be a, a tremendous wasted opportunity. Um, the same is with, you know, uh, uh, too much centralization of the government and too big of a government. Uh, that would be a giant wasted opportunity too. Uh, and, and I don't want to pretend I know the specific answers, but I do think it's a moment uh, that are, is unlikely to ever happen uh, in the future again, if you get it wrong this time. Thank you, Mike. The very, very last question from our side. We all our guests asked this question. What book can you advise Ukrainians, or in this case, maybe not only Ukrainians, to read about the current situation to understand everything? Wow, that's too big a heart of question. <laughs> um, you know, before I answer that, I want to go back to the last thing we were discussing, because there's one giant advantage that Ukraine has that uh, people forget when they talk about these moments of reconstruction uh, comparatively. Um, and it's, it's something that I feel, and, and there's actually empirical evidence for it. You have a very vibrant civil society. Uh, you have a very vibrant uh, local government. Decentralization has been a big achievement of Ukrainian reforms. Uh, and the combination of decentralization and vibrant civil society, I think gives you great advantages that other countries after the collapse of the Soviet Union, including your own country, your own country, it, it, it's more vibrant today than it was in 1991. And I think that gives a giant advantage uh, for, for uh, success. Uh, I am constantly inspired by young people that have worked in civil society, that work in government, that go back and forth. That is a huge, you know, uh, human capital it's called, right? That's a huge advantage that Ukraine has that, that as part of the strategy for reconstruction, we both need to use it uh, and to continue to nurture it, continue to develop it. Uh, I, that to me will be the difference whether Ukraine has a breakthrough or not. Um, in terms of what to read, um, I don't know. I mean, I've just read this book, so maybe that's what I'll recommend. 
Uh, it, it's called The Gates of Europe, A History of Ukraine by Serhii Plochi. He is a professor of, of history uh, at Harvard. And uh, he's probably one of the greatest historians here in the United States about Ukraine, if not the greatest. And I, uh, uh, you know, I'm a professor at Stanford. I teach courses about the, uh, the post-communist world. I'm a political scientist, not a historian. Um, and I wanna admit to you candidly that in re reading uh, Professor Polky's book, um, I, was do I was doing some of my own um, uh, uh, de-imperialism learning, uh, that I had learned some facts wrong. Uh, especially about you know 17th, 18th, and 19th century history, uh, that because I had studied in the Soviet Union, I had studied in Russia, I I had learned things from a Russian perspective, um, and uh, I think it was very healthy for me to re-educate myself about that history to understand uh, certain facts that Putin wants the world uh, to get wrong. So I guess uh, it may sound strange to what should you read about to learn about history today, but I would say that book. Um, there's another one, by the way, that, however, I, I think the history of the Marshall Plan is very relevant uh, to your circumstances today. And there's a, new, there's a book by Ben Steele about the history of the Marshall Plan. Uh, I don't have them in front of me. I'll send you by email so you have them. Uh, the lessons learned about how we did that. Um, and, and some of the conditions, of course, were different, right? That was aid to many countries from one country. Here, it's aid to one country from many countries, right? So that's structurally very different. But I think the, the oversight part uh, and getting, getting a better relationship between the Ukrainian government and the Ukrainian society and the international system, I personally think there should be something new invented for this moment. It's it, just to, to give it to the European Union and the IMF and the World Bank and the European Bank for Reconstruction and Development and USAID. If you just go back, you know, I said there need to be restructuring inside Ukraine. Well, I think there should be some new thinking and restructuring for the donor community too. Uh, and that's what we did with the Marshall Plan. That was new. And that created a new structure that I help, think helped to facilitate um, uh, the connectivities between uh, the countries that were involved in the Marshall Plan and, and the United States. And I think you know, learning from that history might be useful for what to do next vis-a-vis uh, -vis Ukraine today. Yeah, great. Uh, several our guests uh, advised us to read history and read historic books. And of course, he, he is very well known in Ukraine as well as uh, Timothy Snyder uh, with their great books. But uh, you are the first who advised to think about the history of the Marshall Plan because all Ukrainians right now are speaking about Marshall Plan, but uh, it's it would be really, really uh, good uh, for us to understand the history of that. Uh, thank you so much, Mike. Thank you. All right, for thank time. you for having me. All right, good luck thank to you, you guys. Keep up uh, your fantastic work, okay? Yeah, thank you very thank much you. for your support. And uh, that was our project, Ukraine Now, Vision for the Future. And uh, we will conduct these interviews. Thank you. Stay with us. All right. Bye-bye.